In the 1800s, New York's east side was infested with crime, and its people suffered terrible poverty. Manhattan's tenement house districts were the homes of the poor, and the numerous hidden away backstreet saloons cast a shadow over their lives. The poisonous saloons and stale beer dives were the dens where drunkards went to drink away their woes, whilst their children roamed the streets in gangs of growlers, the boy criminals who grew up to be the toughs of the slums. Jacob Rees, 1849-1914, was a Danish-American social reformer and photographer who, working as a police reporter, made a significant contribution to the reform of the city's appalling sanitary conditions by documenting and exposing the squalid accommodation in its tenements and the laissez-faire attitude of slum landlords. As an investigative journalist, Rees uncovered previously dark and hidden corners of the city, exposing the horrific living conditions of the poor to middle class New Yorkers. He was a pioneer of flashlight photography, visiting the slums by night to capture photos of inhabitants going about their lives, providing us with an incredibly important documentary source of New York as it really was in the late 1800s. Today, you will hear his account of the scourge of the tenement districts on the east side. Rum. Saloons were everywhere, legal and illegal, frequented more often than any church, coffee house or reading room. The dram shop took a terrible toll on the lives of New York's poor. You will discover that cheap grog was sold to anyone with a few cents to buy a drink, and the owners of evil often unlicensed. Backstreet dives didn't much care for the law prohibiting the sale of alcohol to children either. Find out how, according to Reese, in the late 1800s, police indifference at best and political corruption at worst kept New York flowing with rum. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, please consider subscribing for more content if you'd like to support what we make for you, check out the description for links to ways you can help us to continue bringing the past alive. Where God builds a church, the devil builds next door a saloon, is an old saying that has lost its point in New York. Either the devil was on the ground first, or he has been doing a good deal more in the way of building. I tried once to find out how the account stood, and counted to 111 Protestant churches, chapels, and places of worship of every kind, below 14th Street, but 4,065 saloons. The worst half of the tenement population lives down there, and it has to this day the worst half of the saloons. Uptown the account stands a little better, but there are easily 10 saloons to every church today. I am afraid, too, that the congregations are larger by a good deal, Certainly the attendance is steadier and the contributions more liberal the week round, Sunday included. Turn and twist it as we may, over against every bulwark for decency and morality which society erects. The saloon projects its colossal shadow, omen of evil, wherever it falls into the lives of the poor. Nowhere is its mark so broad or so black, to their misery it sticketh closer than a brother, persuading them that within its doors only is refuge and relief. It has the best of the argument, too, for it is true, worse pity, that in many a tenement house block the saloon is the one bright, cheery, and humanly decent spot to be found. It is a sorry admission to make that to bring the rest of the neighbourhood up to the level of the saloon would be one way of squelching it. But it is so. Wherever the tenements thicken, it multiplies, Upon the direst poverty of their crowds, it grows fat and prosperous, levying upon it a tax heavier than all the rest of its grievous burdens combined. It is not yet two years since the Excise Board made the rule that no three corners of any street crossing not already so occupied should henceforward be licensed for rum selling. And the tardy prohibition was intended for the tenement districts. Nowhere else is there need of it. One may walk many miles through the homes of the poor, searching vainly for an open reading room, a cheerful coffee house, a decent club that is not a cloak for the traffic in rum. 
The dram shop yawns at every step. The poor man's club, his forum and his haven of rest, when weary and disgusted with the crowding, the quarrelling and the wretchedness at home. With the poison dealt out, there he takes his politics. In quality, not far apart. As the source, so the stream. The rum shop turns the political crank in New York. The natural yield is rum politics. Of what that means, successive boards of aldermen, composed in a measure, if not of a majority, of dive keepers, have given New York a taste. The disgrace of the infamous Boodle Board will be remembered until some corruption even fouler crops out and throws it into the shade. What relation the saloon bears to the crowds, let me illustrate by a comparison. Below 14th Street where, when the health department took its first accurate census of the tenements a year and a half ago, 13,220 of the 32,390 buildings classed as such in the whole city. Of the 1,100,000 tenants, not quite half a million, embracing a host of more than 63,000 children under five years of age, lived below that line. Below it, also, were 234 of the cheap lodging houses accounted for by the police last year, with a total of four million and a half of lodgers for the 12 months, 59 of the city's 110 pawn shops, and 4,065 of its 7,884 saloons. The four most densely peopled precincts, the 4th, 6th, 10th and 11th, supported together in round numbers 1,200 saloons, and their returns showed 27% of the whole number of arrests for the year. The 11th precinct has the greatest and the poorest crowds of all. It is the 10th Ward, and harboured one-third of the army of homeless lodgers and 14% of all the prisoners of the year. It kept 485 saloons going in 1889. It is not on record that one of them all failed for want of support. A number of them, on the contrary, had brought their owners wealth and prominence. From their bars, these eminent citizens stepped proudly into the councils of the city and the state. The very floor of one of the barrooms, in a neighbourhood that lately resounded with the cry for bread of starving workmen, is paved with silver dollars. East Side poverty is not alone in thus rewarding the tyrants that sweeten its cup of bitterness with their treacherous poison. The Fourth Ward points with pride to the honourable record of the conductors of its Tub of Blood and a dozen barrooms with less startling titles. The Tub of Blood was an infamous saloon used by a gang of the same name on the East Side's waterfront in the late 1860s. The West Side, to the wealth and social standing of the owners of such resorts as the witch's broth and the plug hat in the region of hell's kitchen three cent whiskey names onimous of the concoctions brewed there and of their fatally generous measure another ward that boasts some of the best residences and the bluest blood on manhattan island honors with political leadership in the ruling party the proprietor of one of the most disreputable black and tan dives and dancing hells to be found anywhere clubs where all races were admitted. Criminals and policemen alike do him homage. The list might be strung out to make texts for sermons with a stronger home flavour than many that are preached in our pulpits on Sunday. But I have not set out to tell the political history of New York. Besides, the list would not be complete. Secret dives are skulking in the slums and out of them that are not labelled respectable by a board of excise and support no family entrance. Their business, like that of the stale beer dives, is done through a side door the week through. No one knows the number of unlicensed saloons in the city. Those who have made the matter a study estimate it at a thousand, more or less. The police make occasional schedules of a few and report them to headquarters. Perhaps there is a farce in the police court, and there the matter ends. Rum and influence are synonymous terms. The interests of the one rarely suffer for the want of attention from the other. With the exception of these freelancers that treat the law openly with contempt, the saloons all hang out a sign announcing in fat type that no beer or liquor is sold to children. In the downtown 
morgues that make the lowest degradation of tramp humanity pan out to paying interest, as in the reputable resorts uptown, where Inspector Burns's men spot their worthier quarry, elbowing citizens whom the idea of associating with a burglar would give a shock they would not get over for a week. This sign is seen conspicuously displayed. Thomas Burns was head of the New York City Police Department from 1880 until 1885. He popularized the term rogues gallery and is associated with the term third degree, a method of interrogating criminals. Though apparently it means submission to a beneficent law, in reality the sign is a heartless, cruel joke. I doubt of one child in a thousand who brings his growler to be filled at the average New York bar is sent away empty-handed, if able to pay for what he wants. I once followed a little boy who shivered in bare feet on a cold November night so that he seemed in danger of smashing his pitcher on the icy pavement into a Mulberry Street saloon, where just such a sign hung on the wall, and forbade the barkeeper to serve the boy. The man was as astonished at my interference as if I had told him to shut up his shop and go home, which in fact I might have done with as good a right, for it was after 1 a.m., the legal closing hour. He was mighty indignant too, and told me roughly to go away and mind my business while he filled the pitcher. The law prohibiting the selling of beer to minors is about as much respected in the tenement house districts as the ordinance against swearing. Newspaper readers will recall the story, told little more than a year ago, of a boy who, after carrying beer a whole day for a shop full of men, over on the east side, where his father worked, crept into the cellar to sleep off the effects of his own chair in the rioting. It was Saturday evening. Sunday, his parents sought him high and low, but it was not until Monday morning, when the shop was opened, that he was found, killed and half-eaten by the rats that overran the place. All the evil the saloon does in breeding poverty and in corrupting politics, all the suffering it brings into the lives of its thousands of innocent victims, the wives and children of drunkards, it sends forth to curse the community, its fostering of crime and its shielding of criminals. It is all as nothing to this, its worst offence. In its affinity for the thief, there is at least this compensation that... As it makes, it also unmakes him. It starts him on his career, only to trip him up and betray him into the hands of the law, when the rum he exchanged for his honesty has stolen his brains as well. For the corruption of the child there is no restitution, none is possible. It saps the very vitals of society, undermines its strongest offences, and delivers them over to the enemy. Fostered and filled by the saloon, the Growler looms up in the New York street boy's life, baffling the most persistent efforts to reclaim him. Gangs of street children involved in pickpocketing and petty crime. There is no escape from it, no hope for the boy, once its blighting grip is upon him. Henceforward the logic of the slums, that the world which gave him poverty and ignorance for his portion, owes him a living, is his creed, and the career of the tough lies open before him, a beaten track to be blindly followed to a bad end in the wake of the growler.